in Waterloo. How many people went? That's great. For 20 years, I have been organizing and participating in climate events. But that event at the beginning of September was the very, very first time that I attended a climate rally where the speakers at the mic started crying. So a 20 year old woman was at the mic talking about how worried she is about her future and she broke down sobbing and she had difficulty finishing her speech. Then a 30 year old man came up and he started talking and he again choked up and was very concerned about climate change and started crying. So there's lots of reasons for us to be deeply concerned about the climate crisis. You'll probably be aware that two weeks ago the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a special report, SR15, looking at what a 1.5 degree increase to global mean temperatures would mean. And this is the headline from The Guardian. It says, there's one key takeaway from last week's IPCC report, and that is we must urgently uh, reduce greenhouse gases. So these are a few other key findings from that report. We need to limit global warming. Uh, we need to have a massive upscaling of investment. In the synthesis report, they mentioned the importance of investing in a green transformation at least 20 times. And uh, they link uh, action on climate change with the need to meet the sustainable development goals by 2030. They talk about a massive international cooperation and collective effort that's required. And they also talked about the issues of ethics and equity. So I would like for you to think about the climate science as I move forward talking to you about the impacts on the, by the military. So it's not just a climate crisis that we're facing, we're also very much facing an ecological crisis. So we've got worsening air pollution, we have increasing deforestation, increasing uh, species at risk. In the last 60 years, a quadrupling of dead zones in the ocean so that there are now 500 dead zones in the ocean where there is no life at all. So we, we have a climate crisis and an ecological crisis. So this is a picture of a CF-18 fighter jet. This is the fighter jet that Canada used to bomb Syria and Iraq from October 2014 to February 2016. Canada is no longer doing airstrikes, but we are doing all of the refueling. It's part of Operation Impact, but it's part of a broader U.S. effort called Operation Inherent Resolve. These fighter jets uh, burn about 4,400 pounds of fuel every hour. And they use a specialized fuel called JP-8. And JP-8 is, is more refined with toxic additives than the fuel that's used by commercial aircraft. And it costs approximately $17,000 an hour to operate and maintain these fighter jets. So they're very, very expensive. This is statistics from the Department of National Defense about this ongoing campaign called Operation Impact, uh, Canada's contribution to a broader U.S. effort. And you can see in the statistics there that up until last month, Canada delivered over 60 million pounds of fuel to coalition forces to bomb Syria and Iraq. So Canada is part of, like I said, a broader U.S. Uh, operation called Operation Inherent Resolve. And the mission of this operation is to defeat ISIS in the Middle East. Okay, and you can see that we're part of a, of a coalition of about 40 other countries. You can see the Canadian flag there. Every month, Operation Inherent Resolve releases a slide on civilian casualties, and they claim that there's been about 30,000 airstrikes over the last four years, and a thousand, about a thousand innocent civilians that have been killed. But Air Wars, which is a consortium of independent journalists that are operating in the region, says that there are 6,500 innocent civilians that have been killed by Operation Inherent Resolve over the past four years, 30,000 airstrikes, and imagine this, folks. 108,000 bombs have dropped on those two countries in the past 42 months. It's unbelievable. So this is what Canada is, a Canadian military is doing right now. Now, one of the things Air Wars doesn't do is they don't do the climate impacts. Of, of, um, of this operation. So let's talk about 
the military's climate impacts. So the U.S. Department of Defense is the largest institutional consumer of fossil fuels on the planet, spending about $17 billion. Canada's Department of National Defense is the largest federal agency consumer of fossil fuels. Uh, military vehicles like fighter jets, warships, tanks, they, um, they are very fuel inefficient. They have long life cycles and they have locked in energy platforms that are very difficult to modify. And military emissions, you should know, are exempted from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change National Greenhouse Gas Inventories, and they are also exempted from National Greenhouse Gas Reduction Targets. Oh, where do these exemptions, where they, can they be found? One, in Clause 2, or Article 2 of the Kyoto Pro Protocol, the exemption for aviation and marine bunker fuels, and also in the 2006 IPCC guidelines for uh, greenhouse gas inventories. That all countries who are party to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change have to prepare these reports and send them to the UN. Now, why does the military get these special exemptions? Well, let me read a quote from the head of the US delegation for the Kyoto Protocol uh, negotiations in the mid-1990s. And this is from his testimony before the Senate in February of 1998, and he said, we took special pains working with the Defense Department and with our uniformed military both before and in Kyoto to fully protect the unique position of the United States as the world's only superpower and with global military responsibilities. We achieved everything they outlined as necessary to protect military operations and our national security. At Kyoto, the parties, for example, took a decision to exempt key overseas military activities from any emissions targets, including exemptions for bunker fuels used in international aviation and maritime transport and from emissions resulting from multilateral operations. So, I wrote to the Minister of Defence and I asked him if the Canadian military is calculating or estimating the greenhouse gases from Operation Impact, and his reply is no. Eleven months ago, the Department of National Defence in Canada released its very first uh, defense, energy, and environmental strategy. And in that strategy, it's available online, you can see very clearly that they said the, fe the federal reduction target will not include emissions from military activities and operations. But I filed access to information requests, and you can see uh, from some internal documents that the Canadian military uses a lot of fuel. They use ship fuel, they use special jet fuel, they use natural gas, etc. You can see that among federal, all federal departments, that national defense in that pie chart up at the top, you can see that they emit um, more greenhouse gases than any other federal agency. So let's talk about the environmental impacts of the military. So there is severe contamination at military bases across Canada and uh, the United States. Now what are uh, military bases used for? They're used to train soldiers, to test and store weapons, and to prepare for war. So uh, the use of these, the use of this equipment requires toxic chemicals and solvents, uh, there's debris and residue from munitions. There's also unexported ordinances that are contaminating their, the environment. And the Canadian military has a history of environmental racism by the, mili by the military expropriating land from indigenous people. Uh, you might remember a CFB Ipawash and the killing of Dudley George. And the remediation of these sites are very costly and they're not complete. So this is a headline from Newsweek in the U.S. that the U.S. Department of Defense is the worst polluter in the world. And then this is headlines from 2000, from this year, earlier uh, this spring, that the White House has been suppressing a report on widespread water contamination at military bases that are adversely affecting uh, human health and the environment. So in Canada, this is a map of our military bases and installations in all 10 provinces and three territories. And again, in that uh, strategy that was released last year, it says very clearly that the Department of Defense is one of the largest consumers of hazardous uh, material and producers of hazardous waste. So this is a chart from the Federal Contaminated Sites Inventory. It's an online database that you can have a look at. And you can see that 
National Defense is one of the agencies with most of the contaminated sites. If you've got a sharp eye, you'll see that Indigenous and Northern Affairs also has a lot of contaminated sites. But it's not because Indigenous people are polluting their land. It actually is also mil um, uh, military sites and um, sites from the extractive industry that, that Indigenous Affairs is having to deal with. So this is from uh, a little bit more detail from the Federal Contaminated Sites Inventory. I've just showed you two examples. The top one is from CFB Valcartier in Quebec. Uh, there's been groundwater contamination of trichloroethylene. And the other, one, the other one at the bottom is from CFB Greenwood in Nova Scotia, where I used to live, one of the most militarized uh, provinces in the country. And um, there's a contamination uh, from heavy metals and uh, hydrocarbons. So the nearby community of Shannon filed a lawsuit against CFB Valcartier because of their concern that of their wells being uh, contaminated with uh, toxins and they were concerned that it's a, it's a carcinogen, carcinogen and that they were going to um, get cancer and so this case has been making its way through the courts. And even in an, an internal um, federal study by the Department of National Defense showed that the residue from these from the emissions testing um, it persists over time. I mean this is a study looking at CFB Petawawa um, over a hundred years and they showed that these toxins are, you know, are still in the environment and, um, and so these toxins not only stay in the environment but they bioaccumulate through the food chain. So let's talk now about the problem of military expenditures. So according to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute last year, the international community spent $1.7 trillion on the military. There's an intense pressure by the United States and NATO for Canada to increase our military spending. Among all NATO countries, Canada is ranked sixth for military spending, and we are ranked 14th in the world for military spending. So this is a graph from CIPRI, and you can see that huge circle, of course, is the United States spending over $600 billion. China is second at $200 billion, and Canada there is 14th after Australia. Now, last June, our um, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Christia Freeland, stood up in the House of Commons, and she announced our new foreign policy priorities. But look very closely to what she said. She said, Canada needs hard power to maintain and support the global order. And she specifically called for, where the red arrow is there, for an increase to military spending. So this is on Tuesday, June 7th, or June 6th, and the next day, our Defense Minister Harjit Sajjan stood up in the House of Commons, and he announced Canada's new defense policy. So this defense policy, we are going to be spending $553 billion on the military to maintain high level war fighting. You should know that not one MP and not one political party spoke out against uh, the defense policy. This is the biggest announcement that Canada made last year for federal spending and there was absolutely no opposition from any politician or any political party. Let's look at a little bit more closely at this new defense policy. Well, it's even worse than Stephen Harper's Conservatives' 2008 uh, for, uh, defense policy. We are going to be building more warships. We are going to be buying more fighter jets. We are going to be buying armed um, drones, and we are going to be buying attack helicopters, and we are going to be recruiting from minority groups and from women and indigenous people and the uh, Department of National Defense has got a new special fund for research in our universities on the military. So let's have a look together at military spending in Canada. I passed out a sheet. If everybody could have a look at it, it's the, the <coughs> landscape uh, side. I'm sorry, it's very small print. But I want you to have a look at this with your own eyes. This is the latest public accounts, and it shows fiscal spending by the federal government over the past year. On the right hand side is revenues. Um, this is for the period 2007 to the end of March 2018. So you can see that we bring, the federal government brings in 153 billion for personal income tax, 
uh, 47 billion from corporations. You keep sc scrolling your finger down and you can see all the different sources of revenue from sales on goods and services, uh, ex International Monetary Fund, etc., for a total of $313 billion. Now, how does the federal government spend our money? You look on the right hand side under expenses, scroll your finger down slowly, you see at the top there transfer payments. This is money that goes from the federal government to the provinces. You can see the health and social transfer. Social transfer is mostly for post secondary education. And then you can see children's benefits, total transfer payments of about $211 billion goes back to the provinces. Then you see other expenses. Those are our major federal departments. Scroll your finger down slowly, you see Environment and Climate Change Canada at $1.8 billion, Global Affairs at about um, $4 billion. Keep scrolling your finger down, and what sticks out? National Defense at $32 billion. Keep scrolling your finger down slowly. You see public safety and emergency preparedness at $11 billion. That's equivalent to U.S. Homeland Security. That department started in 2004 in Canada. And then you keep scrolling down and you see that we ran a national deficit. Well, one of the things that I did is I created uh, a, this graph going back through the archives of the public accounts and comparing and contrasting spending on the Department of National Defense from 1997 at $8 billion to, to, to now at $32 billion as a, base, as a base amount. And then you can see spending for Environment and Climate Change Canada that has flatlined at about $1.5 billion average over the last 20 years, even though we know that the climate and ecological crisis is getting worse. So what are we doing with all of this money? You might think that we're doing peacekeeping, but we haven't done peacekeeping seriously in the last 20 years. These are the latest statistics from just last month from the UN Peacekeeping Office, and you can see that Canada is ranked um, 58 with about 178 uh, personnel wearing blue helmets. I put another arrow with the United States. The United States is ranked 75th, and they have about 49, 49 uh, soldiers wearing blue helmets, even though our two countries are some of the uh, most well-financed militaries on the planet. We're doing very, very little peacekeeping, and in fact, the peacekeeping that we're doing right now in Mali is essentially, um, we are helping uh, uh, France in its former colony. It's really a neo-colonial project, the peacekeeping that we're doing right now. So let's, let's talk for a minute seriously about Canadian militarism and war making. There is a lot of information in this chart because we are doing a lot of bad things. So some of you might be aware that in 2004, Canada, France, and the United States overthrew the democratically elected government of Jean-Bertrand Aristide in Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere that's absolutely struggling. Um, we, Canada was the one that led the NATO bombing of Libya in 2011. Right now, we are trying to overthrow the government of Venezuela with the Lima Group. We engage in a combat mission in Afghanistan that totally destabilized the country from 2002 and 2014. A report has just been sent to the International Criminal Court to investigate Canada for committing war crimes in Afghanistan. Um, in 2015, an external report came out about, uh, the, about uh, sexual harassment and abuse in the Canadian military and it found that there is a highly sexualized culture that is hostile to women. Canada is army, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Israel and Egypt. Canada is refusing to join the UN ban treaty to, uh, to uh, get rid of nuclear weapons, the worst weapons of mass destruction. Canada is saying no. Um, we are engaged in Operation Impact, as I explained. We have soldiers right now all along Russia's border, from, from Latvia down to Poland. We have been conducting naval exercises with U.S. AFRICOM off the coast of the west and east coast of Africa. We have special forces that are operating across the African continent and the Middle East with no public and parliamentary oversight. Um, and uh, right now, well, we are helping to train uh, basically a right-wing fascist uh, government in the Ukraine, very provocative to Russia, and right now, right now, it started two days ago until November 27th, Canada has sent 2,000 soldiers 
to participate in the biggest NATO exercise since the end of the Cold War in Northern Europe. There are 50,000 soldiers that are right on Russia's border. It, 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 this is just 2,000 Canadian soldiers that are contributing. We've got fighter jets, warships, um, and uh, army personnel in the area. So, I am telling you that militarism and military spending are grave threats to public health and to the environment. And if we are serious about sustainability and peace, we absolutely must demilitarize. We've got to turn this around. So in 2016, a former diplomat named uh, Daryl Copeland, he gave this great speech on a great interview on CBC radio, and he said, there are no military solutions to the most profound problems that are imperiling the planet. It's got to be diplomacy. It's got to be diplomacy. So when I was in England from 2013 to 2015, I was involved in an organization called Campaign Against the Arms Trade. They produced this fantastic report called Arms to Renewables. We need a conversion strategy for Canada and for the United States. This is part of, of the solution uh, for peace and justice. We need conversion and we need divestment, not just from fossil fuels. We need divestment from fossil fuels and from militarism. When I participated in that historic march in Manhattan on cli for climate change in September 2014, there were many Americans with these with these signs that said, uh, windmills, not weapons. That's the message that we need to take to our politicians. So just to bring to your attention, because this isn't widely known, it started about um, 16 years ago. The United Nations has announced a new day. November 6th is uh, the International Day for Preventing the Exploitation of the Environment in War and Armed Conflict. I think this might be an opportunity for us to make the links between uh, uh, peace and um, and the environment and uh, making these links with our friends and colleagues and then these are some resources there's a number um, up there I'm happy to, sh to share my slides and put it up on a website or pass it out to you by email but I just want to flag uh, the last resource at the bottom this year is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King uh, he gave this really profound and important speech called Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break the Silence on April 4th, 1967 at the Riverside Church. Many King scholars say it's the reason why he was assassinated. Has anybody read the speech Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break the Silence? Oh, not very many of you. Well, I brought 10 copies and I will leave them here so that you could take a copy and read it and reflect in it because his message is uh, just as urgent and important for us today. Um, so... He says in that speech, among many other things, he makes the links between militarism, poverty, and racism, but he also says a, a, a nation that continues to spend year after year more money on military uh, defense than programs of social uplift and environmental protection is approaching spiritual death. We absolutely must demilitarize. If we're serious about peace and sustainability, we have to. So I need your help. We need to work together. We can, uh, we can turn this around. So thank you very much for your time and attention, and let's have a discussion. Looking at our engagement around the world, would you say that we are an, an adjunct to the American military? We do our own violent imperial adventures all on our own. Do you want to know one of the great motivations? Is because of Canadian mining corporations. Um, this is one of the reasons why Canada is helping to overthrow the government in Venezuela, is because of Canadian mining and oil interests in the country. But um, there is a fantastic book called uh, Imperial Canada, written by uh, Todd Gordon. He's a professor at at the um, at Laurier University, the Bradford campus, and I encourage you to read it. Canada is, uh, we, 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 uh, there's no doubt that we partner with the United States in, in illegal U.S. wars. We, we were covertly involved in the U.S. war in Iraq that we should uh, pay reparations for, but we have our own, like I said, uh, violent imperial interests, um, and we need to hold our government to count, and we need to, to be honest about about uh, what we're doing in the world. Thank you for uh, an amazing presentation and 
distilling all of your knowledge in such a, a tight way. Um, I'm aware that the U.S. military has uh, bases along the coastlines of the U U.S., especially in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, I think that's the largest base, and that um, the rising uh, sea levels have uh, caused the military, in a kind of ironic way, to be um, banging on the door of the U.S. administration to say, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be underwater uh, soon and we stand to lose a lot. Now, does that reality have any positive bearing on, you know, the U.S. and also, you know, the tight relationship between the U.S. and Canada when it comes to the link between military and environmentalism? So, Norfolk was, um, was unscathed, essentially, in the, la in the hurricane that hit, that hit uh, the East Coast of Virginia. But the Air Force space in Tyndall in Florida was hit straight on. And there was a report in the New York Times that showed that there were about 17 F-22 Lockheed Martin Raptors that were damaged. And the cost of that damage was about $6 billion. Six, sorry, $6 billion. They weren't able to fly all the aircraft out in time. So the military has definitely been concerned about this. And I have read all of those documents by the U.S. military saying that climate change is a concern for them because they're concerned about their bases, and they're concerned that climate change is a threat multiplier. They say this because it's used as a justification to continue their existence, right? We're going to need a military to fight all of this climate-induced chaos and conflict that's going to happen. Well, I think we need to stand up to that. I think we need to say there's actually a lot of evidence that shows that when there's uh, that when there's conflict around natural resources or water or whatever, that people can cooperate to deal with it. You just think about the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, right? Every single country on the planet is a member. They're working cooperatively to try to deal with the climate crisis. So I would like I would like us to have a serious conversation about about. Um, closing down the thousand bases that are around the world, the U.S. bases that are around the world, closing them down and bringing them back to the U.S. and having a, a peaceful green transformation. The military is, is part, is, is complicit in this climate and, and ecological crisis. They are not going to be part of the solution. We need to demilitarize. That, that is the honest truth. So I agree with your idea that we have to demilitarize and decarbonize. But if you're going to see that we have to demilitarize and decarbonize, how do you support that idea when you know that there are other countries out there, other groups, that are willing to harm you? And how do you protect yourself against those other people? Well, I would love more specificity about who's the enemy, because I don't think that there is any. I think there is no enemy. When Chris Hadfield, the Canadian astronaut, was up in the space shuttle, right, spending all that time circling the globe and looking down, you know what he said? He says, I look down on planet Earth, this beautiful, fragile planet, and I see all these people, you know, just getting on with their day, wanting to take care of their families and their homes, right? There, there, there is no boogeyman. Don't, don't believe the fear. There are no enemies. There, there are no enemies. In fact, I mean, there's the, the, the International Space Shuttle is a perfect example of this international cooperation. So we are partnering, Canada, the United States, China, and Russia, on the International Space Program, right? We need to work together to deal with the climate crisis that is affecting all of us, because that is the greatest threat. The greatest threat is the climate crisis. It is not some manufactured boogeyman that justifies the continued existence of the military. And I, I, I would like to um, let you know that this year is the 70th anniversary of Costa Rica uh, abolishing its military. So after its civil war, it got rid of the military and it invested instead in health and education. And they are in, they, th th there's an amazing documentary about their story. It's called A Bold Peace, Costa Rica's Path to Demilitarization, about how they could do it, the former president, uh, Oscar Arias, he was up in Winnipeg just a couple of years ago talking about this need to demilitarize, the need to invest instead in military, into climate change, into free education, into expanding um, health care and pharmacare. 
investing in public transportation, investing in our schools and community centers. That's, that's what we need to be doing. That's what will bring real security for people. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. I have a question regarding NATO. And you had mentioned just uh, in your presentation about the increase in the military budget in Canada. And I'm wondering, A, is that a, a function of uh, the U.S. pressure for us to increase our funding uh, for NATO commitments? And the second part of my question is, what are your thoughts regarding NATO? Ooh, that's a great question. Thank you so much. So yes, do you remember the last time that President Obama came to Canada, 2016, the summer of 2016, as a farewell tour, and he addressed our House of Commons? What did he say in his speech? Three times. Three times he asked us to increase military spending. Go read the speech. And what did every single member of parliament do? They stood up on their feet and they said four more years, four more years. He essentially came as a bagman for, for, for NATO, but it's really, NATO is very much led by the United States, but there is an intense pressure for, from NATO as, 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 as our membership in NATO to increase military spending. But what you hear in the media is, oh, Canada doesn't meet the 2% target for NATO for military spending. Um, we are, our, our spending right now is about 1.7% about, but um, you can see if you're actually looking at dollars that Canada is ranked sixth among the 23 NATO members. Uh, so we actually have very high military spending and you can see worldwide on an actual dollar basis that we're ranked 14th in the world for military spending. Um, next year is the 70th anniversary of NATO, and I am planning, now that I've finished my PhD comprehensive exams, I am going to be working on a campaign through an organization that I'm with called the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace to put into people's, Canadians' minds, the possibility of us getting out of NATO. Being neutral like Ireland, getting out of NATO. We, uh, we want to get out of uh, a very dangerous uh, military alliance. So I would love for your support and to help spread the word. We, we, this, is, this is a Cold War relic. We need to get out of NATO. Hello. Yes, uh, I wanted to thank you for what you're doing here today, and I believe we're winning. Currently, 50% of the oil and gas companies are reliant on oil subsidies, and the ones that aren't are, are reliant on revolving credit from investment banking systems they're borrowing from shorts right now. Like they're, they're literally taking money, investing in their downsize and their failure at the market to create revenue. And I know a lot of companies doing that right now. But uh, what we've got going is um, there's a lawsuit from New York suing Canada for the tar sands for not pricing emissions at the high enough rate. And Exxon had said that they were going to price at a set point of carbon pricing. They never applied it internally, and it's a $30 billion difference. And I think that's a lowball price because we have to factor in the cost of the Gulf War because that is what, where we got the price point to justify the tar sand. And now they don't even have that value anymore. Right now, oil has already hit below. When you, when you take away the price differential plus the exchange rate, they were, the oil was minus 11 cents to 26 cents last week for tar sand product. So uh, in terms of economic hope, is there a way we can call upon the Canadian military to pay carbon pricing, to assess the pollution from bunker C fuel and for all the fuels funding the aviation? If we attack it economically, it won't be worth it to sustain these sectors. So uh, what mechanism could we use to hold our military accountable to carbon emission? Well, two things quickly. Um, it, the, in the United States, there's an agency called the Defense Logistics Agency that purchases all the fuel and all the equipment and everything that the U.S. military needs. And the projections for fuel use by the U.S. military over the next, you know, 30 years, according to the DLA, it's they just show an increase to fuel use. Increase to fuel use. Um, and in Canada, what are we planning on doing? I'm, 
Canada, we are planning on replacing our fighter jets, which is going to be a cost of a minimum of $60 billion. And no one will talk about the climate impacts of this new fighter jet fleet that we're planning on buying, most likely Lockheed Martin F-35s, well, which are full of problems. So um, I, I don't want us to waste any time any money on trying to green the military to make warfare more environmentally friendly. I think that's nonsense. We need to stop putting money in the military for provoking Russia and for getting involved in wars all around the world and, um, you know, to be buying, uh, uh, we're now spending $104 billion to, buy, to build new warships at the Halifax shipyard in, in Nova Scotia where I'm from, 104, we're putting these warships on our dying oceans. We, we cannot be doing this anymore, folks. We just can't, and we need to confront our politicians, and we need to talk honestly about this with our friends and family, with our colleagues, and I would like to challenge the environmental community, because that's my professional background, environmental law and policy. Actually, I came to this work on peace because of envir my environmental background, but there is not one national environmental organization, eco-justice, environmental defense, David Suzuki, um, just on Nature Conservancy, none of them, none of them will talk about this. None of them talk about the climate and environmental impacts of the military. And at the climate march, the Rise for Climate that was held in Waterloo in the beginning of September, every other issue was talked about, but, but the fact that the military is exempted from this, about military expenditures, right? So we, we need to start speaking out about this, uh, making the links, and, and then doing something about it. Is it time for a group photo?